Book four, part four of the Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus, translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Broadrib. Book four, eighty twenty-three through twenty-eight, part four. Tiberius retires from Rome. Meanwhile, after long reflection on his purpose and frequent deferment of it, the emperor retired to Campania to dedicate, as he pretended, a temple to Jupiter at Capua and another to Augustus at Nola, but really resolved to live at a distance from Rome. Although I have followed most historians in attributing the cause of his retirement to the arts of Sejanus, still, as he passed six consecutive years in the same solitude after that minister's destruction, I am often in doubt whether it is not to be more truly ascribed to himself, and his wish to hide by the place of his retreat the cruelty and licentiousness which he betrayed by his actions. Some thought that in his old age he was ashamed of his personal appearance. He had, indeed, a tall, singularly slender and stooping figure, a bald head, in a face full of eruptions, and covered here and there with plasters. In the seclusion of Rhodes he had habituated himself to shun society and to hide his voluptuous life. According to one account, his mother's domineering temper drove him away. He was weary of having her as his partner in power, and he could not thrust her aside, because he had received this very power as her gift. For Augustus had had thoughts of putting the Roman state under Germanicus, his sister's grandson, whom all men esteemed. But yielding to his wife's entreaties, he left Germanicus to be adopted by Tiberius, and adopted Tiberius himself. With this, Augusta would taunt her son, and claim back what she had given. His departure was attended by a small retinue, one senator, who was an ex-consul, Cosius Nerva, learned in the laws, one Roman knight, besides Sejanus, of the highest order, Curtius Atticus, the rest being men of liberal culture, for the most part Greeks, in whose conversation he might find amusement. It was said by men who knew the stars that the motions of the heavenly bodies, when Tiberius left Rome, were such as to forbid the possibility of his return. This caused ruin for many who conjectured that his end was near, and spread the rumour, for they never foresaw the very improbable contingency of his voluntary exile from his home for eleven years. Soon afterwards it was clearly seen what a narrow margin there is between science and delusion, and in what obscurity truth is veiled. That he would not return to Rome was not a mere random assertion. As to the rest, they were wholly in the dark seeing that he lived to extreme old age in the country, or on the coast near Rome, and often close to the very walls of the city. It happened at this time that a perilous accident which occurred to the emperor strengthened vague rumours and gave him grounds for trusting more fully in the friendship and fidelity of Sejanus. They were dining in a country house called The Cave, between the Gulf of Amukle and the hills of Fundi, in a natural grotto. The rocks at its entrance suddenly fell in and crushed some of the attendants, Thereupon panic seized the whole company, and there was a general flight of the guests. Sejanus hung over the emperor, and with knee, face, and hand encountered the falling stones, and was found in this attitude by the soldiers who came to their rescue. After this he was greater than ever, and though his counsels were ruinous, he was listened to with confidence, as a man who had no care for himself. He pretended to act as a judge toward the children of Germanicus, after having suborned person to assume the part of prosecutors and to invade specially against Nero, next in secession to the throne, who, though he had proper youthful modesty, often forgot present expediency, while freedmen and clients, eager to get power, incited him to display vigor and self-confidence. This, they said, was what the Roman people wished, what the armies desired, and Sejanus would not dare to oppose it though now he insulted alike the tame spirit of the old emperor and the timidity of the young prince. Nero, while he listened to this and like talk, was indeed not inspired with any guilty ambition, but still occasionally there would break from him willful and thoughtless expression, which spies about his person caught up and reported with exaggeration, and this he had no opportunity of rebutting. Then again alarms under various forms were continually arising. One man would avoid meeting him, another, after returning his salutation, would instantly turn away. Many, after beginning a conversation, would instantly break it off, while Sejanus's friends would stand their ground and laugh at him. Tiberius, indeed, wore an angry frown or a treacherous smile. Whether the young prince spoke or held his tongue, silence and speech were alike criminal. 
Every night had its anxieties, for his sleepless hours, his dreams and sighs were all made known by his wife to her mother Livia, and by Livia to Sejanus. Nero's brother Drusus, Sejanus actually drew into his scheme by holding out to him the prospect of becoming emperor, through the removal of an elder brother, already all but fallen. The savage temper of Drusus, to say nothing of lust of power in the usual feuds between brothers, was inflamed with envy by the partiality of the mother Agrippina towards Nero. And yet Sejanus, while he favoured Drusus, was not without thoughts of sowing the scenes of his future reign, well knowing how very impetuous he was, and therefore the more exposed to treachery. Towards the close of the year died two distinguished men, Asinius Agrippa and Quintus Haterius. Agrippa was of illustrious rather than ancient ancestry, which his career did not disgrace. Haterius was of a senatorian family and famous for his eloquence while he lived, though the monuments which remain of his genius are not admired as of old. The truth is, he succeeded more by vehemence than by finish of style. While the research and labours of other authors are valued by an after-age, the harmonious fluency of Haterius died with him. In the year of the consulship of Marcus Licinius and Lucius Calpurnius, the losses of a great war were matched by an unexpected disaster, no sooner begun than ended. One Attilius, of the freedmen class, having undertaken to build an amphitheatre at Fidina for the exhibition of a show of gladiators, failed to lay a solid foundation to frame the wooden superstructure with beams of sufficient strength, for he had neither an abundance of wealth nor zeal for public popularity, but he had simply sought the work for sordid gain. Thither flocked all who loved such sights, and who, during the reign of Tiberius, had been wholly debarred from such amusements, men and women of every age crowding to the place because it was near Rome and so the calamity was all the more fatal. The building was densely crowded. Then came a violent shock, as it fell inwards or spread outwards, precipitating and burying an immense multitude, which was intently gazing on the show or standing round. Those who were crushed to death in the first moment of the accident had, at least, under such dreadful circumstances, the advantage of escaping torture. More to be pitied were they who, with limbs torn from them, still retained life, while they recognized their wives and children by seeing them during the day, and by hearing in the night their screams and groans. Soon all the neighbors, in their excitement at the report, were bewailing brothers, kinsmen, or parents. Even those whose friends or relatives were away from home for quite a different reason still trembled for them, and as it was not yet known who had been destroyed by the crash, suspense made the alarm more widespread. As soon as they began to remove the debris, there was a rush to see the lifeless forms, and much embracing and kissing. Often a dispute would arise, when some distorted face, bearing, however, a general resemblance of form and age, had baffled their efforts at recognition. Fifty thousand persons were maimed or destroyed in this disaster. For the future it was provided by a decree of the Senate that no one was to exhibit a show of gladiators whose fortune fell short of four hundred thousand sesterces, and that no amphitheatre was to be erected except on a foundation the solidity of which had been examined. Attilius was banished. At the moment of the calamity the nobles threw open houses and supplied indiscriminately medicines and physicians, so that Rome then, notwithstanding her sorrowful aspect, wore a likeness to the manners of our forefathers, who after a great battle always relieved the wounded with their bounty and attentions. This disaster was not forgotten when a furious conflagration damaged the capital to an unusual extent, reducing Mount Celius to ashes. It was an ill-starred year, people began to say, and the emperor's purpose of leaving Rome must have been formed under evil omens. They began in vulgar fashion to trace ill luck to guilt, when Tiberius checked them by distributing money in proportion to losses sustained. He received a vote of thanks in the Senate from its distinguished members, and was applauded by the populace for having assisted, with his liberality, without partiality or the solicitations of friends, strangers whom he had himself sought out. And proposals were also made that Mount Celius should, for the future, be called Mount Augustus, inasmuch as when all around was in flames only a single statue of Tiberius in the house of one Junius, a senator, had remained uninjured. This, it was said, had formerly happened to Claudia Quinta. Her statue, which had twice escaped the violence of fire, had been dedicated by our ancestors in the temple of the Mother of Gods. Hence the Claudii had been accounted sacred and numbered among deities. And so additional sanctity ought to be given to a spot where heaven showed such honour to the emperor. It will not be uninteresting to mention that Mount Calius was anciently known by the name of 
square Quintilanus, because it grew oak timber in abundance and was afterwards called Caelius by Caelius Fabina, who led the Etruscan people to the aid of Rome, and had the place given him as a possession by Tarquinius Prissus, or by some other of the kings. As to that point, historians differ. As to the rest, it is beyond a question that Vabina's numerous forces established themselves in the plain beneath and in the neighborhood of the Forum, and that the Tuscan street was named after these strangers. But though the zeal of the nobles and the bounty of the prince brought relief to suffering, yet every day a stronger and fiercer host of informers pursued its victims, without one alleviating circumstance. Quintilius Varus, a rich man and related to the emperor, was suddenly attacked by Domitius Offer, the successful prosecutor of Claudia Pultra, his mother, and no one wondered that the needy adventurer of so many years, who had squandered his lately gotten recompense, was now preparing himself for fresh iniquities. That Publius Dolabella should have associated himself in the prosecution was a marvel, for he was of illustrious ancestry, and was allied to Varus, and was now himself seeking to destroy his own noble race, his own kindred. The Senate, however, stopped the proceedings, and decided to wait for the Emperor, this being the only means of escaping for a time impending horrors. Caesar, meanwhile, after dedicating the temples in Campania, warned the public by an edict not to disturb his retirement, and posted soldiers here and there to keep off the throngs of townsfolk. But he so loathed the towns and colonies, and in short every place on the mainland, that he buried himself in the island of Capri, which is separated by three miles of strait from the extreme point of the promontory of Sorrentum. The solitude of the place was, I believe, its chief attraction, for a harbourless sea surrounds it, and even for a small vessel it has but few safe retreats, nor can any one land unknown to the sentries. Its air in winter is soft, as it is screened by a mountain, which is a protection against cutting winds. In summer it catches the western breezes, and the open sea round it renders it most delightful. It commanded, too, a prospect of the most lovely bay, till Vesuvius, bursting into flames, changed the face of the country. Greeks, so tradition says, occupied those parts, and Capri was inhabited by the Teleboi. Tiberius had by this time filled the island with twelve country houses, each with a grand name and a vast structure of its own. Intent as he had once been on the cares of the state, he was now for thoroughly unbending himself in secret profligacy and a leisure of malignant schemes. For he still retained that rash proneness to suspect and to believe, which even at Rome Sejanus used to foster, and which he here excited more keenly, no longer concealing his machinations against Agrippina and Nero. Soldiers hung about them, and every message, every visit, their public and their private life, were, I may say, regularly chronicled and persons were actually suborned to advise them to flee to the armies of Germany, or, when the forum was most crowded, to clasp the statue of the divine Augustus and appeal to the protection of the people and senate. These counsels they disdained, but they were charged with having had thoughts of acting on them. The year of the consulship of Solanus and Silius Nerva opened with a foul beginning. A Roman knight of the highest rank, Titius Sabinus, was dragged to prison because he had been a friend of Germanicus. He had, indeed, persisted in showing marked respect towards his wife and children, as their visitor at home, their companion in public, the solitary survivor of so many clients, and he was consequently esteemed by the good, as he was a terror to the evil-minded. Latinius Latiaris, Portius Cato, Petitius Rufus, and Marcus Opsius, ex-praetors, conspired to attack him, with an eye to the consulship, to which there was access only through Sejanus, and the good will of Sejanus was to be gained only by crime. They arranged themselves against that Latieras, who had some slight acquaintance with Sabinus, should devise the plot, that the rest should be present as witnesses, and that they should begin the prosecution. Accordingly, Latieras, after first dropping some casual remarks, went on to praise the fidelity of Sabinus in not having, like others, forsaken, after its fall, the house of which he had been the friend in its prosperity. He also spoke highly of Germanicus and compassionately of Agrippina. Sabinus, with the natural softness of the human heart under calamity, burst into tears, which he followed up with complaints, and soon with yet more daring invective against Sejanus, against his cruelty, pride, and ambition. He did not spare even Tiberius in his reproaches. That conversation, having united them, as it were, in an unlawful secret, led to a semblance of close intimacy. 
Henceforward Sabinus himself sought Latieris, went continually to his house, and imparted to him his griefs, as to a most faithful friend. The men who I have named now consulted how these conversations might fall within the hearing of more persons. It was necessary that the place of meeting should preserve the appearance of secrecy, and if witnesses were to stand behind the doors, there was a fear of their being seen or heard, or of suspicion casually arising. Three senators thrust themselves into the space between the roof and ceiling, a hiding-place as shameful as the treachery was execrable. They applied their ears to apertures and crevices. Latieris, meanwhile, having met Sabinus in the streets, drew him to his house and to the room, as if he was going to communicate some fresh discoveries. There he talked much about the past and impeding troubles, a copious topic indeed, and about fresh horrors. Sabinus spoke as before and at greater length, as sorrow, when once it has broken into utterance, is the harder to restrain. Instantly they hastened to accuse him, and having dispatched a letter to the emperor, they informed him of the order of the plot and of their own infamy. Never was Rome more distracted and terror-stricken. Meetings, conversations, the ear of friend and stranger were alike stunned. Even things mute and lifeless, the very roof and walls, were eyed with suspicion. The emperor, in his letter on the 1st of January, after offering the usual prayers for the new year, referred to Sabinus, whom he reproached with having corrupted some of his freedmen, and having attempted his life, and he claimed vengeance in no obscure language. It was decreed without hesitation, and the condemned man was dragged off, exclaiming as loudly as he could, with head covered and throat tightly bound, that this was inaugurating the year, these were the victims slain to Sejanus. Wherever he turned his eyes, wherever his words fell, there was flight and solitude, the streets and public places were forsaken. A few retraced their steps and again showed themselves, shuddering at the mere fact that they had betrayed alarm. What day, they asked, will be without some execution, when, amid sacrifices and prayers, a time when it is usual to refrain even from a profane word, the chain and halter are introduced. Tiberius has not incurred such odium blindly. This is a studied device to make us believe that there is no reason why the new magistrates should not open the dungeons as well as the temple and the altars. Thereupon there came a letter of thanks to them for having punished a foe so bitter to the state, and the emperor farther added that he had an anxious life, that he apprehended treachery from enemies, but he mentioned no one by name. Still there was no question that this was aimed at Nero and Agrippina. But for my plan of referring each event to its own year, I should feel a strong impulse to anticipate matters, and at once relate the deaths by which Latinius and Opsius, and the other authors of this atrocious deed perished, some after Caius became emperor, some even while Tiberius yet ruled. For although he would not have the instruments of his wickedness destroyed by others, he frequently, when he was tired of them, and fresh ones offered themselves for the same services, flung off the old, now become a mere incubus. But these and other punishments of guilty men I shall describe in due course. Asinius Gallus, to whose children Agrippina was aunt, then moved that the emperor should be requested to disclose his apprehensions to the senate, and allow their removal. Of all his virtues, as he counted them, there was none on which Tiberius so prided himself as his ability to dissemble, and he was therefore the more irritated at an attempt to expose what he was hiding. Sejanus, however, pacified him, not out of love for Gallus, but rather to wait the result of the emperor's wavering mood, knowing, as he did, though slow in forming his purpose, yet having once broken through his reserve, he would follow up harsh words with terrible deeds. About the same time Julia died, the granddaughter of Augustus. He had condemned her on a conviction of adultery, and had banished her to the island of Trimeris, not far from the shores of Apulia. There she endured a twenty years' exile, in which she was supported by relief from Augusta, who, having overthrown the prosperity of her stepchildren by secret machinations, made open display of her compassion to the fallen family. The same year the Free Sea, a nation beyond the Rhine, cast off peace, more because of our rapacity than from their impatience of subjection. Drusus had imposed on them a moderate tribute, suitable to their limited resources, the furnishing of ox-hides for military purposes. No one ever severely scrutinized the size or thickness till Olenius, a first-rank centurion, appointed to govern the Frisii, selected hides of wild bulls as the standard according to which they were to be supplied. This would have been hard for any nation, and it was the less tolerable to the Germans, whose forests abound in huge beasts, while their home cattle are undersized. 
First it was their herds, next their lands, and last the persons of their wives and children, which they gave up to bondage. Then came angry remonstrances, and when they received no relief, they sought a remedy in war. The soldiers appointed to collect the tribute were seized and gibbeted. Olenius anticipated their fury by flight, and found refuge in a fortress named Flevum, where a by no means contemptible force of Romans and allies kept guard over the shores of the oceans. As soon as this was known to Lucius Apronius, propraetor of Lord Germany, he summoned from the upper province the legionary veterans, as well as some picked auxiliary infantry and cavalry. Instantly conveying both armies down the Rhine, he threw them on the Frisii, raising at once the siege of the fortress and dispelling the rebels in defence of their own possessions. Next he began constructing solid roads and bridges over the neighbouring estuaries for the passage of his heavy troops, and meanwhile, having found a ford, he ordered the cavalry of the Caninifates, with all the German infantry which served with us, to take the enemy in the rear. Already in battle array, they were beating back our auxiliary horse, as well as that of the legion sent to support them, when three light cohorts, then two more, and after a while the entire cavalry were sent to the attack. They were strong enough, had they charged altogether, but coming up as they did at intervals, they did not give fresh courage to the repulsed troops, and were themselves carried away in a panic of the fugitives. Apronius entrusted the rest of the auxiliaries to Cathagus Labeo, the commander of the Fifth Legion, but he too, finding his men's position critical, and being in extreme peril, sent messages imploring the whole strength of the legions. The soldiers of the Fifth sprang forward, drove back the enemy in a fierce encounter, and saved our cohorts and cavalry, who were exhausted by their wounds. But the Roman general did not attempt vengeance, or even bury the dead, although many tribunes, prefects, and first-rank centurions had fallen. Soon afterwards it was ascertained from deserters that nine hundred Romans had been cut to pieces in a wood called Braduhenes, after prolonging the fight till the next day, and that another body of four hundred, which had taken possession of the house of one Cryptorix, once a soldier in our pay, fearing betrayal, had perished by mutual slaughter. The Frisian name thus became famous in Germany, and Tiberius kept our losses a secret, not wishing to entrust any one with the war. Nor did the Senate care whether dishonor fell on the extreme frontiers of the empire. Fear at home had filled their hearts, and for this they sought relief in Sycophany. And so, although their advice was asked on totally different subjects, they decreed an altar to clemency, an altar to friendship, and statues round them to Caesar and Sejanus, both of whom they earnestly begged with repeated entreaties to allow themselves to be seen in public. Still, neither of them would visit Rome, or even the neighbourhood of Rome. They thought it enough to quit the island and show themselves on the opposite shores of Campania. Senators, knights, a number of the city populace flocked thither, anxiously looking to Sejanus, approach to whom was particularly difficult, and was consequently sought by intrigue and by complicity in his counsels. It was sufficiently clear that his arrogance was increasing by gazing on this foul and open-displayed servility. At Rome, indeed, hurrying crowds are a familiar sight. From the extent of the city no one knows on what business each citizen is bent. But there, as they lounged in promiscuous crowds in the fields or on the shore, they had to bear day and night alike the patronizing smiles and the supercilious insolence of hall-porters, till even this was forbidden them, and those whom Sejanus had not deigned to accost or to look on returned to the capital in alarm, while some felt an evil joy, though there hung over them the dreadful doom of that ill-starred friendship. Tiberius, meanwhile, having himself in person bestowed the hand of his granddaughter, Agrippina, Germanicus's daughter, on Cineus Domitius, directed the marriage to be celebrated at Rome. In selecting Domitius he looked not only to his ancient lineage, but also to his alliance with the blood of the Caesars, for he could point to Octavia as his grandmother, and through her to Augustus as his great-uncle. End of Book Four